So I'm going to uh, talk about my favorite subject, which is me, for just a, a little moment to give you a sense of uh, who's speaking to you today. And then I'll talk about Calvium, where I work, give a little bit of an overview of our perspective of digital placemaking, uh, and then some context around um, what we mean by our future towns and cities and what placemaking and therefore digital placemaking means um, in that context, our shared context and then present you with um, four case studies. So in terms of me, um, uh, I kind of chunked my, myself up by career in the 21st century. So I was a founding creative director of Nesta Future Lab. Nesta is the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts in the UK. And Future Lab was born to look at um, new and emerging technologies and how they could be used to uh, enrich learning in all forms of different learning situations. I then moved to Central St. Martins, which is um, an arts and design college, uh, which is part of the University of the Arts London. And there I was digital projects director for uh, seven years, um, working across all forms of um, subject area, all, all dis disciplines at undergraduate and postgraduate. At the same time, doing my PhD um, in Bristol. And, um, and then for the last three years, I've been working uh, for Calvium. And Calvium is a leading digital agency, as it says here, combining expertise in experience design, software engineering, and mobile innovation. And we've got a really wide client base, and you can see all the lovely illustrious logos here. Um, and so that can, we've got people involved who are developers, place management, who look after stewardship and, and governance, councils, estates, as well as large scale manufacturers such as Rolls Royce. But that, the key thread that um, runs through is around innovation. When I look at the projects that we do with our, our wide client base, um, it's always pretty much, um, they always seem to want to work with us when it's new, when they're wanting to do something that is new to them or new to the sector. And we have a particular specialism which goes back for about 20 years, whilst the company itself is 10 years old. The uh, founding directors were out of Hewlett Packard Labs, so the research center for Europe for HP, um, where they worked in what is now termed digital placemaking. So that interaction of people, place and technology, and I should say, and data. So people, place, technology and data. And those are the lenses I think that um, we need to think about. Um, and so what, so that's this section, if you can see my cursor right in the middle here. And, um, that's all about delivering bespoke location-based digital solutions for clients. So um, why focus on digital technologies? Well, one of the ways that we act in and upon the world, the way that we understand the world these days and for the past 20 years is through the use of digital technologies, particularly since smartphones have become you know, our core personal devices. And I say, that because I think around uh, 85%, 80 to 85% of people in the UK certainly have um, smartphones as well as smart watches and huge amounts of people in their homes are having um, uh, voice controlled hardware and software. I think in the UK and the US actually, it's something like one in four. And nowadays, obviously, and since we've all been locked in, um, in particular, we're using digital platforms such as we are today to, to connect, to, uh, to allow us to work and shop and, and socialize and so forth. So if we think about digital placemaking, what I'd like you to do is, is, is look here for the moment, because often we talk about the other. We have physical space, that, the built environment, that which is around us and we walk through, and often talk about digital space as elsewhere. So that, and that can be the case if it's a Facebook or a social platform that isn't intimately enmeshed and entwined within um, your locale. But what we also have increasingly is, um, what, what I like to use is the concept of hybrid space. So where we have that overlap and you see how happy the little, little guy's face in the illustration is when he's thinking about hybrid space. Um, there's other concepts that you can use and, and that people do use such as, digital layers um, over the built environment. Um, another one is um, kind of thinking about making a material. So it's bits and atoms where you're constructing with uh, digital technologies and, and matter. 
Uh, but as I say, hybrid space works pretty well for me and for a lot of the people that I work with and communicate with. And in terms of this presentation, um, the definition that we'll be thinking about um, and using in terms of digital placemaking as a thing is the augmentation of physical places with location specific digital services, products or experiences to create more meaningful destinations for all. Now, it's also an activity. So how do you do digital placemaking? Again, uh, what one has to do is again, thinking people, place, technology and data. You have to understand the users. So you have to understand people, the context of use, the technology and the technology to inform and underpin location-based digitally enabled solutions. So let's remind ourselves, as Anne was saying about definitions of and ways of thinking about placemaking, um, that when we talk about placemaking, we're, we're really thinking about the pedestrian level um, and we're thinking about shared public spaces. And we're asking ourselves, uh, how can we shape the public realm to make places where people want to live, people want to be, people want to pass through, uh, where people can participate and have valuable and, and varied different types of relationships with space and where people can maximize, um, uh, or we, people, where we can maximize shared value. So it's a bit about digital placemaking and hopefully that, that sets it up for the, um, the present, well not presentations, for the case studies that I'm going to show in a little bit. But before I do, let's um, turn our attention to the context of future towns and cities, because we're not gonna be working in a bubble. So we know that different places face very different realities. The experience of living in um, Valletta is very different to living in Bristol, where I'm from, or Buenos Aires, Budapest, Benghazi, where I was born, New Delhi, Nairobi, Naples, and so on and so forth. But these places, and therefore us, uh, the people who, oh, excuse me, the people who live in them, uh, or visit them or read about them or have heard about them from their grandmother, as I have about, um, about Malta, as I was saying the other day to Stefan and Anne, um, we're all facing big challenges. And this is the context within which we're operating and will be operating. And you've seen one of the slides for those big challenges, but here we go, we all know these, they're the um, UN Sustainable Development Goals. So these you know, are environmental, social, economic, um, and we can just pick on a few, which would be um, climate change. You know, we've got to change the relationship between uh, biodiversity and the city to um, affect life in our future cities. Um, nine out of 10 people, that's it, nine out of 10 people living in the world's urban areas are exposed to particulate matter, according to the world, health organization that's above their guideline level. So we've got to deal with that. Um, we have social division. So there's massive, and I can cite the UK, massive polarization in many countries. Just look what happened to us in terms of um, Brexit. Um, public health and well-being. I mentioned the um, uh, air pollution, but also childhood obesity is, is common in the under fives across the world um, and uh, the World Health Organization's 2016 report said that we are increasingly um, struggling with, adults are increasingly struggling with low emotional well-being in sizable proportions of the population. And of course, there's economic um, inequality and, and life remains financially precarious. Um, so all these and so many more things, they're all, all part of that context that we're, we're working with. And of course, at the moment, there is coronavirus as well. Um, as I say, it's the context within which placemaking and digital placemaking, um, which is just a component that adds to technologies, um, operates today and will operate in the future. So we're dealing with um, complexity and we're dealing with uncertainty and we're dealing with emergence and we're dealing with opportunity. Um, so with this in mind, how can we harness digital placemaking um, 
to make our towns and our cities, our future towns and our cities, more livable and sustainable, which is the theme of our session today. The, the great news is that um, there's evidence from practitioners worldwide um, that suggests routes to travel, directions that we can go in. And um, I write quite a lot about digital placemaking. I hadn't realized quite how much I do write about digital placemaking until I went to our website, um, calvian.com, and saw a, a range of themes. And these, this is just some of the themes that, um, that, I, that I look at. Um, but today, I think I'm going to concentrate on, um, on two areas. And those areas are, oh, well, so I encourage you actually to, to look at the website. Uh, but the areas today that I want to look at are community inclusion and accessibility, where I'll highlight two, two projects, and also heritage. Um, so I mentioned coronavirus earlier. And um, what we've seen in the, across the world in the last few weeks as a response to the challenge of coronavirus is a, is a wealth of community action of all forms. Um, whether it's people singing together on their balconies in Italy or people in the UK who are clapping together on their doorsteps in solidarity for the, uh, and support of the NHS workers and indeed all the citizens who are putting themselves in harm's way to sustain the country or a candlelight um, vigil in India and, and so forth. We've also seen grassroots action, really inspiring grassroots action because people want to have agency, they want to help and they want to be involved. So um, although I'm from Bristol at the moment, I'm, I'm in South Somerset and uh, I live in Bristol, but I'm, I'm in South Somerset supporting my mother um, through her, um, her quarantine. So um, in South Somerset, some hospital uh, staff, uh, at the community hospital said that it would be great to have an um, individually wrapped savory snacks. That's what they would really like to help get them through. So no, no sooner said than done and members of the community got together. And as you can see in the bottom uh, right photograph, of, you know, lovely big boxes of snacks. Um, in Spain, a manufacturer of furniture, and this is a, um, a screenshot from a um, from Dazine, um, who normally creates um, robotic 3D printed furniture for, for instance, Zaha Hadid Associates, has pivoted and as a um, because of the lack of PPE, suitable PPE for um, healthcare workers. Uh, Nagami Design is now printing um, face shields to help protect medical staff, as it says here, from coronavirus. So what we're seeing here is um, participation, is people take, wanting to take action, having agency in the world, and agency is that key, key word, um, being involved in their, in their neighborhood and, and in their planet. And in, on, in and on their planet. So now I'd like to kind of segue into some, uh, some interviews that I did. So when we think about how people want to be involved in the planet, planet this is one or in their, in their neighborhoods. This is really horrible, um, uh, some really horrible quotes actually, I find really upsetting. Um, and when I was working with um, uh, Open Inclusion and some of their, who are a research agency, um, some, are, and we were looking at how people feel, who are neurodivergent, feel when they're traveling through rail stations, railway stations in the UK. Here are three things that were said by three separate people, and this will be exactly the same for wherever you are, for members of your community, or maybe sometimes for yourselves. So I hate King's Cross because it's just too manic, and I was walking around crying, how do I get out? Another person said, if a train is late and there are people pushing and shoving, it's really frightening. I'm a grown man and I shouldn't be frightened. Third quote, and this is the third of many, it's just the third one I've picked. I'll be brave and stand at the end of the platform, although then I can't see the signs. So what we've got here are examples of three people in public space who are expressing, and, and you don't know this, but they 
expressed in a very mundane way, in just the way that I'm talking to you. Not with their, not crying and with their hair, pulling their hair out or anything, but their everyday experience of traveling in public space, they're using words such as hate and being frightened and needing to feel brave because of the way that the, the, the environment was set up and was designed in such a way that it excluded. And so my position, and I'm sure, I would hope most people's position, is that we have to design um, for our future towns and cities in an inclusive way that supports access. And one way of doing that, and what I have as a case study here, because these were some of the um, comments that um, helped to inform the case study, is a digital placemaking um, project that um, Calvi and Brand with uh, our partners who are Transport for London and um, Connect Connected Places Catapult, I mentioned open inclusion, and also is funded through the government's department for transport. And so um, Navsta is a mobile wayfinding system to enable people with different access needs to navigate railway stations independently and with confidence. As I mentioned, the people who we worked with um, were um, identified as being neurodivergent, but they also had many other, or some of them had many other um, issues as well. So what um, we designed was a wayfinding system that would assist people um, when they plan a journey through a station, undertake a journey through a station, and manage uncertainty through a station. And I just wanted to, to um, emphasize here again from the World Health, World Health Organization's Enabling Environments, that environments, so the public realm, public spaces, placemaking was what we're talking about, but environments, whether they be physical, social, or attitudinal, can either disable people with impairments or foster their participation and inclusion. Uh, as part of the research process, because um, the participants worked with us right from the get-go when we tested the hunch, it, it seems like a good idea, right the way through to, um, you know, through design, uh, different iterations of design and um, testing on site. So these are the screen grabs, so I can quickly show you, you those. Um, so basically we were saying you can plan a journey through the station because what we discovered was 70% of participants uh, felt that planning was absolutely key to their ability to, um, to understand if where they wanted to go had the um, access needs that they, um, that they required and also to allow them to see and prepare how they would move through the station. It's a step-by-step -step, um, landmark-based navigation. Um, which also, so you can see photographs here, which also allows you to um, select your route and the information is provided through audio, uh, picture and sound because we were told that those were the different modes of communication that um, the participants required. Okay, so what, what, um, there, uh, what we're saying there is and what we're seeing is evidence of agency where a digital placemaking project gives people agency as a critical part of the design process. And this is a functional wayfinding system that's designed for and with community members and provides access to public spaces. Um, in terms of, I'll move on now, uh, there isn't a video here, but I have got two others, so fingers crossed. Um, uh, this is a second project and this is really beautiful. And some of you may know this one, um, because it, we did it back in, uh, I think, 2017, but it's absolutely stunning. And it's with, um, need to find innovators to work with in this, in this realm sometimes. And Igloo are sustainable developers who are um, a UK-based company. And they um, recognised that the, the developments that, um, that they were uh, and are uh, creating often have, you know, a 25-year time span. And as we were saying before, digital technologies are enmeshed in, in the world around us and um, how, can the, um, how can their developments, which are um, not necessarily but often mixed use, in this case mixed use, um, how, how can they be as good as they, they could be and how might digital technologies um, provide different experiences in terms of, in this case, in terms of public space. Um, 
So this was a research project which was commissioned by IGLU. And it was very much, um, uh, it's called Ideascape. And it was asking how existing, as I say, existing and emerging technologies can support rich social experiences in Cardiff Bay. And this is as well as economic. So Ideascape, and this is the area where if you can see the rings, that's Cardiff Bay. It's a, uh, well, it's the last, this is the last 38 acre site of the regeneration of Cardiff Bay. And we conducted three activities. We had discussions with various stakeholder communities. We had a multi-stakeholder co-creation workshop, and we had an interactive um, showcase event. Because what we wanted to do was find out, as I said, uh, uh, find out about digital placemaking, um, the opportunities there, but also digital placemaking, this is why I'm, I'm using it, as a tool to, um, to kind of discover and, and um, create the conditions where we can treat each, other's, treat each other as, um, as friends and create spaces um, for encounter. So it isn't all, the digital technologies can be used as probes to find out more about senses of neighborhood and, and so forth. And I'll, I'll hopefully the rest will explain that. So what we did, having had the, um, the stakeholder uh, engagement, um, is we, along with the stakeholders, came up with um, ideas as to how digital technologies might foster, uh, might, might be these probes, um, to look at, and as, as we've got here, attitudes to the digital in digital placemaking. So um, for the event itself, the showcase event was held in the public space. People were invited or could just rock up. And we had 10 probes. So ten, one piece of augmented reality. We had, uh, it was all lo-fi. We had a, a, a space booker, which was just a, a sketch animation and so on and so forth. So showing the different ways within which um, technology in, in, in place could be experienced. Um, and what we noticed was that there was a, um, the attitudes as we have here to digital and digital placemaking. People were willing, citizens were willing to explore. Um, there was a desire for digital placemaking to be an open and inclusive practice that's sensitive to the existing environment and accountable to the public. And also importantly, in these days when um, there's the smart cities, there's uh, or notions of smart cities, there's an awful lot of uh, facial recognition going on um, and so on and so forth and surveillance. Um, what what this, uh, this encounter did was enabled people to get a greater sense of the scope of what that actually meant, what the practice actually meant of the different types of surveillance and, and so on. So um, in the report I, uh, with the, that I wrote, I said the, the Ideascape event contributed to expanding people's conceptual understanding of the range of ways and applications in which they could experience location-specific digital tech and content. Queen conspiring there with some Catholic priests. But mm. what is this debauchery that I hear tell of at the Cock Inn for which you were indicted? Please tell all. Charles and I dined at the Cock. My Sarah, have you heard? Guys, now be sorted. Yeah, right. You with young Francis yeah. Stewart, yeah. Labelle yeah. Stewart. What else? Of course I have it. Is something wrong, Dr. Rowland? Well, this matter touches all of us this night, and therefore the license should be read.
Nanda. Right, well, I'll just quickly explain what's going on here because th this is just looking at heritage. So um, what's going on here um, and um, in terms of heritage is that the his historic royal palaces um, wanted to find out and they, they, they own or they look after um, six different palaces in, um, in and around London. And they also look after the Palace of Whitehall, which is no longer there. What it is now is, as you can see here, the Ministry of Defence building. And so they wanted to see how might new and emerging technologies, such as haptic tech, augmented reality and so forth, which is sound-based, be able to bring a theatrical experience and bring meaning into a location um, that has a completely new identity that physically is not as the uh, Whitehall Palace was, which was raised to the ground 300 years ago, um, and could do so in a way that uh, gave a really um, compelling and meaningful visitor experience. And, um, and we worked on this project for uh, a year and it was so popular, um, it, was, it was rolled out for a year, and it was so popular that they ran it again the, um, the following year. Uh, so just to finish by saying that um, the opportunities for digital placemaking to enhance relationships with uh, people and places, well, number one is design inclusively, and we've seen how we can do that with Navster. That there's community agency in future towns and cities is, is key, as we saw in Ideascape. Revealing stories about a place in new ways, as we saw with the Lost Palace. Um, and one that you didn't see, but we can, I can send you a link, is to reconnect places, objects and people in new ways with Hidden Florence 3D. And I'm finished there. <laughs>